The question I want to address in this video is what kinds of behaviours, what kind of attributes would you expect a system to exhibit in order for us to think it worthy of calling it an agent? That is, what kinds of attributes are we going to be talking about building uh, into the systems that we call agents? Well, previously we saw that the basic idea of an agent is it's a system that's capable of autonomous action, autonomous decision making, in order to achieve delegated goals. Um, but I argue that there are systems like thermostats that have those attributes, they're capable of acting autonomously to achieve delegated goals, although the decision making is so simple that we certainly wouldn't think of them as being intelligent. So what kind of attributes are we thinking about when we talk about intelligent agents? And what I would argue is that we typically think about three attributes associated with this notion of agency. And the attributes that I'm going to argue for are the notions of reactiveness, proactiveness, and social ability. So what I'm going to do in this video is just explain what I mean by these three attributes and why they're important. Okay, so reactivity. Okay, reactivity simply means realising when the world has changed so as to mess up your plans, so as to make your plans unachievable and responding, replanning, reorganizing your activities, responding in time for those responses to be useful. That's the core of reactivity. So let me give you an example. This morning I have to get to work. So how am I going to get to work? I plan when I wake up to catch a bus. So I walk to the bus stop and I wait for the bus, but no bus turns up. Okay. What do I do? Well, I don't do a core dump. I don't show a blue screen of death. Uh, I don't throw an exception. What I do is I form an alternative plan. Okay, the bus didn't turn up, so what is an alternative plan? I'll hail a taxi. Okay? So this is forming an alternative plan when you realise that your current plan, that is catching a bus, is just not going, to, uh, is not going to work. Reactivity is important because most of the environments in which we think about putting agents are dynamic. They're changing. They're changing in ways beyond our agents' control. If we knew that the environment was exactly as we imagined it to be, that is, if we knew that the bus was going to turn up on time, then we wouldn't have to worry about reactivity. Okay? If we knew exactly what the effect of our actions were going to be, then we wouldn't have to worry about reactivity. But we don't. Things change in ways beyond our control. And sometimes the actions that we perform don't have the consequences, the effects, that we would like them to have. And in that situation, we need to monitor our environment. We need to look around us as we're doing things in order to decide whether or not we need to change our current plan or whether or not we can continue with our existing plan, whether or not our existing plan is going to achieve the goal that we want it to achieve. So what we're talking about is building software systems that can do that. Now, if you think about a... A uh, function in C or a procedure in Pascal or a method in a language like Java, think about the way that they execute. What they do essentially is they blindly execute. You start at the first line of code and you carry on executing. Okay? Now we typically write a procedure or a function or a method in order to achieve some goal. And in computer science terminology, that goal is called the post condition of the procedure, the post condition of the function. Okay? What our procedure doesn't do, what our method doesn't do is it's executing, is stop and look around and say, am I still going to accomplish my post condition? Okay? Am I still going to achieve the goal that I was written to achieve? But actually, if you think about us in real life, that's exactly what we do. As I'm executing my plan to get to work, I stop and I look around. Is this going to work or do I need to replan? Okay, so those are the kinds of capabilities that we're thinking about when we think about reactivity. The idea of stopping, looking around you, deciding whether or not your current plan is going to have its desired effect. And if not, then responding to those changes in time for them to be useful. Well, reactivity in some sense is, is very easy. You can build a very reactive system just with a lookup table. And the lookup table has just what's called stimulus response rules. It says, if I see this stimulus, if my environment looks like this, then do this corresponding action. And in order to decide what to do, all you have to do is go down the lookup table until you find a situation that matches your current, until you find a, a left-hand side on that lookup table that matches your current situation, and then perform the corresponding action. And it's computationally easy to do. But actually, 
Uh, that will give you reactivity, that will give you reactive agents, but actually the point is we want agents to do things for us. We want them to achieve our delegated goals. And this kind of stimulus response type behavior is not the most effective way of building uh, uh, such agents, agents that can exhibit goal-directed behavior. So when we talk about proactiveness, what we mean is exhibiting goal-directed behavior, capable of working towards a goal, being delegated a goal and then deciding how best to try to achieve that goal. That's what we mean by proactiveness. We mean goal-directed behavior. So we've got two properties so far, reactiveness and proactiveness. Reactiveness, realizing when the environment's changed, modifying your behavior accordingly, so you're still going to achieve your delegated goal. Proactiveness, systematically working to achieve your goals. Okay? Well, uh, if, you look, if you've ever worked in uh, an environment with a manager, okay, where somebody's been managing you, you will realize that managers come in two flavors. There is reactive manager and proactive manager. And what reactive manager does is he continually responds to events and is never capable of setting the agenda and never manages to achieve anything just because every day when you get into the office, they've got a new plan, they've got a new direction, they're going somewhere different. Okay? And that's reactive manager. And then at the other extreme, you've got proactive manager. He sets this goal, this is what we're going to do, and you're all, ge you're all geared up to, do, to working towards that goal, even if the goal becomes irrelevant, okay? even if it becomes irrelevant or unachievable. Okay? So what we value in human managers is the ability to get a good balance right between being reactive and proactive. So for example, setting a plan, devising a plan of activity that's going to achieve your goal, and working towards that plan, but still looking around you and realizing when that plan is no longer going to work, when you need to change that plan, when you need to change your behavior accordingly. Okay? So getting a good balance right between being reactive, that is responding to changes in your environment, and between being proactive, that is exhibiting goal-directed behavior. Now, this is something that people don't find it easy to do, right? If you, and if you've ever worked with reactive and proactive manager, you will appreciate the limitations of those two extremes of behaviors. So it's, it's a property that we value highly uh, in humans when they can get that balance right between being reactive and proactive. What we're going to be talking about is building software that can be both reactive and proactive. So just as it's, it's not easy to build cute to have humans that have those kinds of attributes, it's not so easy to build software that has them. But we will see some of the main approaches that have been developed to building software with those attributes. Then the final property I want to talk about is social ability. So in a sense, social ability is trivial for computers, right? Because everything's connected to the internet these days, and social ability is just communicating. But uh, when we talk about social ability in multi-agent systems, we're talking about something richer than that. We're not just talking about exchanging bits, getting a bit from one agent to another, from one system to another. We're talking about the kinds of social ability that we have as humans. Okay, the ability to, not just to communicate in terms of exchanging bits, but the ability to coordinate, to negotiate, and to cooperate with other agents. That is, when you have a goal which is shared with another agent, then the ability to cooperate with them, to work with them, to try to achieve that goal. When you need to reach agreement on a matter of common interest, the ability to negotiate, to have software agents that can negotiate with other agents. Okay? Those are the kinds of social ability that we are talking about. And this is particularly important if we think that the delegated goals that our agents have are in some sense in conflict with one another. That is, they're different goals. In situations like that, then you need the ability to negotiate, to reach an agreement on some disputed matter. Okay, so the kinds of ability then, in order for an agent to be uh, what we'll call an intelligent agent, although I'm aware that the term intelligent here, we need to wrap that in scare quotes a little bit, the three key behaviors are reactive, proactive, and social. Reactive capable of realizing when the environment has changed and responding, modifying your behavior accordingly. Proactive, capable of exhibiting goal-directed behavior, being given a delegated goal and systematically working to achieve that. Getting a good balance right between being reactive and proactive. Okay? And then finally, social ability, the ability to cooperate, coordinate and negotiate with other software agents.